So, hello everybody. I'm Professor Rosane Silveira from the English Graduate Program at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And it is my pleasure to mediate this event promoted by Abralin, the Brazilian Association of Linguistics. Uh, this is one of the many lectures and roundtables of the event called Abralin Live Online Linguists. And this event is organized in cooperation with the International Permanent Committee of Linguists, the Association of Linguistics and Philology of Latin America, the Argentinian Society of Linguistic Studies, and the Linguistic Society of America. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I would like to introduce our presenter, Professor Andrew Wadel, or Andy as he prefers. He's an associate professor, a professor at the Department of Linguistics uh, at the University of Arizona. Professor Wadel's research investigates changes in the sound system by relying greatly on computational simulation to explore the interactions between languages' uh, tendency toward pattern coherence and to preserve semantically relevant contrasts. His work is uh, theoretically oriented by exemplar theory and usage-based uh, theory. Here in Brazil, I relate Professor Wadel's research with the investigations conducted by Professor Thais Cristóforo Silva and her research group from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, uh, who also make, uh, she also makes a case for the close interaction between phonetics and phonology, for the role of the lexicon in explaining sound change, and for a view of, an, uh, of, the, of understanding the creation of sound systems as a result of language use. Uh, our guest is, um, ha holds a PhD in linguistics from the University of California, Santa Cruz, completed in 2004, the same year that I completed my doctoral degree. And the title of his dissertation is Self-Organization and Categorical Behavior in Phonology. Uh, our guest has many important publications in journals such as Language, Journal of Memory and Language, Journal of Language Evolution, Language and Speech, and Language and Cognition. Uh, I would like to invite you to watch the lecture and post your comments on our chat. Uh, later, I will select some questions for our guest to answer after the presentation. And he said there is no limit in the number of questions. So let's try to have uh, as many questions as we can in two hours, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the title of this uh, presentation of this lecture is The Role of Communication Efficiency in Shaping Language. So please, Professor Wadel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Let me see if we can get this organized. Um, are we now here? Is this not working? There we go. Okay, we're good. Um, yes, so again, my name is Andy Wadel. I'm actually a full professor now. Thank you. Um, that's been relatively recent and a nice thing. Um, I'm going to be giving a talk, as I said, on the role of communication efficiency in shaping language. And the work that I'm going to be talking about has been done in conjunction with my uh, graduate student now, PhD, Adam King, and my colleague and husband, Adam Usishkin. Uh, we all work or worked in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, there will be a few pictures of the uh, area right around uh, Tucson in the talk, just so you can get a sense of the strange and wonderful place that we live in. This is a picture of the Sonoran Desert just outside our home. Um, the Sonoran Desert is shared between Southwest Arizona and Northwest Mexico, and it's an extraordinary and beautiful place. All right, um, uh, just a few notes to start. Um, I'll of course try to answer as many questions as I can uh, after the talk, but uh, any questions that I can't get to, I'll be happy to um, answer um, online later on. So please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. I'm always here. Okay. <clears throat> 
So as we all know, starting at the very first class of linguistics that worldwide languages exhibit many similar structures at many levels, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and more. And one of the big questions is how this happens. Here's an example from German that we probably all know, and that's final obstinate devoicing. Um, uh, so for example, the, uh, the lexical item for the German word for dog ends in a D underlyingly, but it surfaces as Hund. And you only see that there's actually a D um, when it's in the plural and that D is protected from the word edge and then it shows up as Hund. And why is this not working? Hmm. Okay, we're just gonna have to do it this way. Um, so word final obstinate devoicing is found everywhere across the world in unrelated languages. For example, Maltese, Catalan, Polish, Turkish, Lele, Nyonyo, Tokpisin, and everywhere you look, there is some language in the family that has final devoicing in some way or another. And the question that I would say motivates a good part of all of linguistics is, What's the underlying reason for all of these similarities? And this just gets back to why do languages have the patterns that they do? So one version of a traditional approach, there are of course many, many, many versions of this kind of explanation, but this is a caricature, sort of a cartoon of one way to think about this. And that is just simply that the abilities and limitations of the innate language faculty, universal grammar, favor or allow certain patterns over others. <clears throat> And I'll be working uh, in, and many, many other people work in a somewhat broader framework that includes this idea that there are, of course, constraints in language specific cognition that shape what kinds of patterns are possible and or more likely to arise. But there are also structural similarities between languages because they evolve over time with similar constraints and context, contexts that are outside of specific language cognition. And a biological parallel to this. Um, I was a biologist before I was a linguist, so of course I love and I see the biological parallels all the time. So convergent evolution gives rise to strikingly similar morphological structures in different animals, different life forms, when they need to do similar things out in the world. And presumably these similarities are not only shaped by the genetic possibilities that arise in a particular organism based on its history and the infrastructure that it has physically, but also just that, that the, the physical constraints um, that shape how that task can best be um, done. And so what we see is wings in all sorts of unrelated creatures. Um, so here's a little cartoon, a very simplified cartoon of selection in biology. We have, as we know, we've got an individual. There's selection that influences whether that individual is able to re reproduce. Reproduction in introduces novel genetic variation producing another individual. And this goes around and around and around. And because selection filters what, how the population continually updates, we get gradual change shifts in the properties of a population. And what's interesting for this talk is that selection in biology can in principle come from absolutely anywhere. Anything that has any influence on reproductive probability is a form of selection and it can just as equally have a, a, um, an influence on biological change as anything else. So here are some examples. Um, we know that there's selection from the physical environment. So for example, altitude and lung capacity. There's selection from the biological environment. We know that when people uh, are under a lot of um, selection pressure from the presence of malaria, there's a particular mutation in blood cells that, that keeps people from dying from malaria as much. But if you have two copies of it, you also get sickle cell anemia. And you can look that there's a very clear um, overlap between where malaria is most prevalent and where the people have sickle cell anemia most often. There's also selection in the social environment in biology. Um, sexual selection is a great example where particular properties um, aid in mate 
um, selection and mate success. And you and what's interesting with this, and I find particularly interesting in the context of language, in the context of sociolinguistic pressures, is that very often sexual selection can result in the creation of very odd structures that are otherwise not very adaptive. So of course the peacock's tail is a lot of work and it makes the peacock much more um, easy to see from predators, but there's a trade-off with, does the peacock get a date? Okay, what do all these factors have in common? And that is that they influence reproductive success. So now we're gonna segue to language from here. So it turns out that language provides functional parallels to reproduction at many levels. We don't have reproduction in the sense of particular units that copy themselves in quite the same way that we have in biology, but mathematically, all you need is something that can be described as a population where the population reproduces itself in some way and there are some external factors that influence what, what parts of the population get, in, uh, get reproduce more. And of course, there are many, many, many levels in, 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 in language that can be described in exact, exactly this way. So I'm gonna be talking about one level and that is the level of the individual and how their own um, language competence and their lexicon and their, their accent changes over the course of their life. And the basis for this is a lot of experimental results that shows that lexical representations are not fully non-redundant as it has been proposed in some earlier models, but they in fact store very detailed information and wildly differing types of information. So the kinds of phonetic variation that someone has heard before, the context of use, which phonetic variants they hear in which context, which kinds of person is liable to say this particular word or this word with this pronunciation and so forth. And what we know is that lexical representations can be gradually updated by ongoing experiment experience. And this gives rise to what's called the production perception feedback loop, which I'll describe in the next slide. And the upshot is that when we are in a speech community, there are small changes happening all the time, but the speech community tends to maintain some sort of coherence because we're always imitating each other. So members of a speech community are always accommodating to each other. And what that means is that consistent variance, if there is consistent, some consistent kind of variation that's introduced into that speech community that can spread and become the norm. So, just like in biological selection. Under this model, we don't have a way to limit in principle what kinds of biases could potentially underlie the development of new patterns in a language. That's an empirical question. Certainly there are certain things that simply can't influence um, biological, or sorry, linguistic evolution. For example, things that we simply cognitively aren't able to process or aren't able to perceive. Um, all right, so let me just give you, this is a cartoon uh, that represents, um, it, it, uh, it, it sort of copies what we just saw with the bio biology cartoon, but it's a, the same sort of thing um, representing uh, a cartoon of language. So we have mental representations in categories, and when we produce them, we can introduce variation. We can introduce variation in the pronunciation, in the context of use, any sorts of things. And what we already know, what's already in our mental representations and what's in the social context, what's everywhere, whether we have a cold or not, can influence and select what kind of variation we produce. And in the same way, at the listener side, the same thing, what we perceive, how we interpret it, can be biased by the system that we have, how much noise there is in the environment, all sorts of things. And then we go back to our mental representations. And just like in biology, anything that influences this variation and how it can affect our linguistic representations could in principle shape the trajectory of language change in a speech community. So you can see that this model starts with as a very big tent. It says, 
what might be out there. Let's go and look. So in practice, how do linguists generate hypotheses about the sources of biased variation? And in pr practice, what we do is we may have a prior theory and we make predictions from that. Okay, based on this prior theory, I expect that language might in fact do this or do that under this circumstance. That's sort of predicting from the top down. But we also predict from the bottom up when we are looking at language and we observe a consistent pattern, then that can prompt us to look for possible sources of that consistency. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is so certain patterns that people have noticed over and over and over again, for centuries in fact, that language use and language patterns, at least some of them seem to be shaped by a desire for people to communicate accurately, but at the same time, reduce the effort that is required for production and or perception. So George Zipf identified one such pattern and wrote a lot about it in the 1930s. And he called this the law of abbreviation. And we're all very familiar with this. He showed and he found, and many other people had shown before him that frequent words are shorter and infrequent words tend to be longer. And this is just a beautiful representation of that. This, this um, slide right here, this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a whole lot of different languages. What's nice about this is it's the same semantic object essentially. And what we're asking is, is there, in the x-axis, you can see the word length normalized for the largest, longest word in the, in the document versus the shortest word in the document for that particular language. And the number of times, the probability that that particular word occurs in the document. And you can see that there's this beautiful, beautiful relationship that holds in all of the languages that words that are very long, like these over here, tend to be improbable. And words that are quite short tend to be the most probable words. And this has been shown to be, a, be an apparent language universal. I don't know of any language where it's been found where this is not at least tendentially uh, true. And from that, he developed, and as again, many other people have thought the same thing before and since, um, that languages tend to evolve structures which minimize effort while preserving communication accuracy. And Zipf called that the principle of least effort. Um, actually, let me just, uh, briefly say why this word length um, relationship uh, is relevant here. And that is that if we assume that it takes more effort to make a longer word, to produce a longer word, our listener needs more help with an unpredictable word, a word that they're not expecting. And so we need a more extensive signal to help them understand that word with the same sort of probability, we, we wanna make their understanding, uh, so that the probability that they understand uh, up to some particular level, then we need to give them extra help with the signals that they're not expecting. So now to this slide. Cloud Shannon um, in the 1940s and 50s in the United States formalized much of this and developed an entire mathematical structure around some of these expectations called information theory. So he formalized the predictions about the most efficient ways to optimize communication, communication systems, given that we want to maximize information transmission accuracy, we wanna minimize effort however effort is defined in terms of the amount of time it takes, the amount of material that we have to use in order to make a signal, et cetera, given the existence of noise, where noise doesn't literally, or it can mean literal acoustic noise in the background, but it's to, it actually has a, a broader meaning here, and that is anything in the environment that interferes with the integrity of the signal as intended. Okay, and there are many, many, many uh, basically every kind of communication system shows the influence of optimization for information theoretic properties. So of course, human language, animal communication systems, telecommunication systems. So we, we see Zipf's law of, of abbreviation in the Morse code as well. So Morse, long before Zipf, realized that 
the rare letters that he wanted to transmit should have more dots and dashes in them. And the most frequent ones could have shorter numbers of dots and dashes. And what that would mean is that over an entire message, that would reduce the total num amount of dots and dashes that the um, sender would have to create and the listener would have to process. And it's also, of course, everywhere in biological systems as well, DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolic circuits. These are all, in a sense, information transmission systems. Information structure goes from here to somewhere else. All right. I want to make a quick note. This is here to remind me about a quick note I want to make on teleology and the term optimization. In this general field that I'm working on about the interaction of communication accuracy and effort in languages, when people are looking at these larger patterns, they use the word optimize all the time. They say this language is optimized for that in this particular way. And that sounds teleological. It sounds like the language has some purpose. It has some agency and it wants to be a particular way and that there is some particular goal out there. And the reason, part, part, part of the reason that we need to do that is just that our human language, our language is perhaps because of the world, the, the world that we live in socially and physically, our language is built to talk about unitary causes and effects. And we're, we're, our words are built to talk about agency. They package all of that up. And in this, in a lot of physical systems, we actually want to talk about micro interactions at lower levels that work together over time and through selection and through self-organization to create some structure up at a much more abstract higher level that often looks optimized with regard to some physical constraint. And we don't have any verbs that will encapsulate this idea of self-organization and consider, um, continual tra uh, structural transfer all the way from micro levels to macro levels. So people use the word optimize all the time and I will use the word optimize in this lecture, but never think that when I use that, that I actually mean that there's a goal that some agency is working towards. That's just a shorthand. Okay, now that that's done. So there are a lot of other examples in language of the apparent trade-off between accuracy and effort. And in many cases, we can show not only that the language as a whole seems to show some uh, particular categorical pattern, but we can see speakers in real time modulating these things. Um, so there's a great paper, and there's a number of other papers as well that show that um, when languages have word order options, pop possibilities of ordering phrases in this way or that way in a particular sentence, speakers tend to order those phrases. They use that variability to minimize the working memory load of the listener. So for example, here's a really nice sentence in English, John threw out the old trash sitting in the kitchen. So we have John threw out and we've got a very long object here. It's perfectly licit in English to say, John threw the old trash sitting in the kitchen out. And in fact, that's a very common structure when the object is very short. But the longer it gets, the more likely we are to put the out before that. And what um, these uh, Futrell et al. showed is that across a wide, wide, wide range of languages, um, there's a very, very strong tendency for speakers to minimize these dependency lengths in actual utterances or actual writing. Um, so let me now move to some of these sorts of effects in spoken language in the phonetics. So we know that when new words are brought into the language, they very frequently are made out of their, their longer or their collocations or their um, uh, sequences of words, and when they become probable, when they become much more frequent, they become short. So electronic mail, uh, we of course became email. Um, laboratory, we very often say lab instead. The very frequent word probably, that's sort of unusually long for such a probable word, but in actual pronunciation, we very rarely say probably unless we are really emphasizing it. 
So you, many of you have seen the written form prale, but actually in spoke, at least in my dialect, um, the English that's spoken around where I am, in rapid speech, it's most often produced just as pry, as in I'm probably gonna go to the store. Um, all right. Words like memory, which are common, which theoretically should have three syllables, but it's pronounced most often with two, memory. And contrast that with a word that's virtually the same, but it's very low frequency. So we have the word memory, and it is never reduced to memory. In fact, if I heard that, I would have difficulty with lexical access. I wouldn't know what that word was. All right. And we can find the same sorts of patterns in microphonetic uh, um, pronunciation. So imagine this is something that will be very easy for everybody to um, empathize with. If I am talking to somebody and I say, I've got an animal, it is a cat. Now cat is a very probable um, continuation of this particular um, sentence in English. Um, and what that means is I don't actually have to say the word cat very clearly in order for my listener to understand what I said. It's okay if I, for example, don't say it very clearly, if I elide the, fat, the last T, or if I'm speaking with my mouth full, or if a truck drives by, they're still under many circumstances going to be able to reconstruct that I said the word cat because it's so probable. On the other hand, if I am actually saying it's a calf, that's a possible continuation, but it's just a very unexpected one. It's still an animal and it's possible that I have one. Um, but in this particular case, unless there's a lot of other contextual support, I'm gonna to have to pronounce that word very clearly in order for my listener to not assume that they've heard, they've mistakenly heard something weird. Um, and what we know is that people actually do this. People pronounce, people hyper-articulate words in cases where there's less, where there's more ambiguity. And one thing I should say, at the end of this lecture, I have compiled a, a non-exhausted sample of references for all of the things that I'm talking about. All right, so here's some work that we did in our lab um, uh, with no one else and Rebecca Sharp um, a number of years ago, showing that people do this with vowels in English. So this is just a little cartoon of a portion of the uh, vowel space of English, uh, my version of English, e, i, e, and a. Uh. So this is sort of standard American English with those particular vowels. Um, they overlap, they're close to one another. Anybody who speaks a language with a, a reasonable, nice five vowel system has had trouble trying to figure out how on earth these vowels actually differ from one another. And speakers of English, of course, actually do have trouble with that as well. Um, and what we showed was that speakers of English, when they're speaking casually, they bias the pronunciation of these vowels to move words away from other existing words. So with the context LFT, we have the word lift in English and we have the word left in English. We don't have a lemma lift and we don't have a lemma luft. And what we found um, in a very big corpus of spoken English is that people do the following sort of thing. When they say the word left, they bias the e eh towards a. Uh. They produce, it's an e, eh, but it's over on the side of the e eh space that's closer to a, uh, and vice versa when they say the word lift. The i eh vowel is actually biased closer towards the e end, and we found this um, throughout the entire vowel, front vowel system of English. And this suggests that speakers in real time, as they're producing language, they are making micro variations that help disambiguate closely related lexical items. So these sorts of findings give us a sort of a low level mechanistic pathway that would produce in over long periods of time, a link between word length and probability. So information biased phonetic reduction should lead over time to shortening of words where those sounds are uh, low information because the word is already very expected. Whereas hyperarticulation, like I just showed you, producing a sound more clearly 
when it, when it contains a lot of information, when it does work to disambiguate two words, that should help maintain the lengths of the less probable words. All right, and that over time can give you ZIPF's um, law of abbreviation. Now, now I'm gonna start, I'm gonna segue to talking about work from our own laboratory that shows, I think, two particular very exciting things that help um, provide consistent evidence for this entire big story. And I'm gonna start by noting that modulating the number of segments in a word is not the only way to help listeners understand what the word is or help the speaker use less effort to produce it. And the reason is is because segments differ in how much information they convey to a listener. So here's just an example. Look at this word over here, oodles, on the right. Um, that first sound, oodle, for the, the oo right there, is an extremely rare sound that to begin a word of English. If you actually try to think how many sounds, words in English actually begin with the sound oo, you'll discover that there are very, very few. And so what that means, if a listener knows that a new word is starting and they hear an oo, that's super informative because that helps the listener immediately start to discount virtually all of the lexicon. On the other hand, we have a word like sit over here, and there are lots and lots of words in English that start with the sound s. So hearing a s, that's great. We heard the sound s to begin a word, but that doesn't help. That only lets us disambiguate and get start discounting a smaller part of the lexicon. Okay, so from that, we can generate a hypothesis that low predictability words should not only be longer, just as it found, but they should also evolve to contain higher information segments. And that's what we're gonna be testing. So this is work led by Adam King, who just got his dissertation. Um, I just got his PhD. His dissertation is amazing. It expands on all of this material in very, very exciting ways. Um, and the reference is in the, uh, at the end of this talk. Um, what I'm going to be talking about here is the finding fact that low probability words contain higher information segments, especially early. And this is, again, a beautiful picture of um, one of the mountainsides that's not very far from here. Okay, so getting on to the informativity of segments. Not all segments are inform equally informative, and one of the reasons for that is that we process words incrementally. What that means is once a listener knows, has a good, uh, good cue that a new word is starting, they immediately begin searching the lexicon from the very first phonetic cue. They don't wait until they get some signal that the word has ended, storing all that information up without accessing it, looking at it, and then start to do a lexical search. So listeners progressively narrow down what part of the lexicon they're looking at as they hear the phonetic signal. And what that ends up meaning is that earlier segments contribute much more disambiguating information on average than later segments. So here's a little just thought example. I'm actually, I'm going to say the word vacuum. And my listener knows that I'm about to start a new word and they hear the sound of v provided that they've perceived that accurately, they've gotten a lot of information because there are relatively little, there are few word types in English that start with the sound v. So v helps them just uh, eliminate a lot of the uh, lexicon. Then they hear more, they hear more, and pretty soon they've gotten all the way to vacuum. Okay. Now they get to the last segment, m. And that last segment now gives the listener virtually no information because by the time the listener has already processed vacuum, there's almost nothing left. In fact, the only things that are left in the lexicon are either the word vacuum or words that are closely related to that word vacuous, um, vacuum, blah, blah, whatever. Uh, so that M is almost entirely redundant. 
And this is a general feature. And it's a, it's a feature that has to be true if you actually have a, anytime you've got incrementally process, incremental processing where you're trying to disambiguate possibilities, earlier bits of information necessarily mathematically are going to give you more information than the end segments, the end pieces of information. Um, and humans aren't the only ones that do this. Uh, uh, Google does this as well. Any sort of speech processing um, uh, uh, program will do this because it's efficient to start predicting forward from the information that you already have. That's why in email, Google now can suggest all sorts of continuations in the sentence. One of the things that I've learned is that I am really, really predictable when I'm writing emails because 90% of the time, what Google predicts, suggests, is exactly what I was going to say anyway. So just to be stubborn, I, even if I have to say it, I, I choose to try to say it in a new way. All right, but in, uh, when we text, um, a, the initial, especially we have, if we have a longer word, we need to more precisely type in the first segments and we can get progressively sloppier as we go. So here is a little video of me typing in the word November. Let's see if this works. November and then loop. So I got basically to November and then I just wiggle my fingers around and it doesn't matter. My phone knows that I meant November because there's really nothing left by the time I get to Novem. Okay, so the big prediction is that segments of words are going to evolve relative to their lexical neighbors so that less probable words are distinguished more quickly. This is the same basic idea as less probable words have more total signal so that a speaker, a listener, has more opportunities to figure this out if we start a less pre a predictable word with more information, the rest of the word is more redundant. And so the speaker, the listener also has more opportunities to figure out what that word was. Okay, so we're gonna test this. First, I'm gonna show you um, an example from real English. So let me move this out of the way so I can see. Um, so just to recap, the information contributed by a segment is going to in part depend on how many alternatives, how many competitors it eliminates. And in general, as a word goes on, the more segments that have already been perceived by a listener, the fewer remaining options there are. So here's the example of two words, monster and thorax. And these two words are going to basically show you exactly what we were looking for and exactly what we found in lots of different languages. So in the x-axis, we have segment position. And in the y-axis, we've got segmental information. And I'm not gonna go over what the um, calculation is that we use for segment information. It's down there in the bottom right here. Uh, you're welcome to read more about that in the paper that describes all of this. So let me go through the information in each one of the segments, starting with monster. So M, up there. Ah, considerably less information. N, st, er, at the bottom. And you can see that there's this um, uh, steady drop-off. Now, in, in the rest of the lexicon, it's not always the case that the drop-off is this smooth but it's always tens down. Um, and the interesting thing to notice is that by the time you've gotten to er, it's giving the listener essentially zero information. It's redundant. And that's because by the time you've already processed monst, there's virtually nothing left. And it's not that the er is giving the listener nothing because any redundant information helps you recover from noise earlier in the signal. All of the calculations that we're doing here make the sort of nice and easy to calculate assumption that every single sound that comes before a particular sound has been accurately perceived. And when that's the case, 
this error provides no information to the speaker, to the listener. But in the, in the event that there was any uncertainty before, it still provides disambiguating information. All right, now let's look at the word thorax. And it starts much higher. That theta is much higher because there are many fewer word types in English that start with theta than start with M. So that theta actually provides considerably more information than the M does. And then here's how we go. And what's interesting to note, and this is what we find in general, is that by the time you get to the ends of words, they don't differ very much in how much information successive segments give. And that's because by the time you get there, everything has been disambiguated already. Now this picture right here, where we have the less common word thorax and the more common word monster, the thorax starts with higher information than the monster does and then they decay to something very similar by the end. This is in fact the whole result. What we find is that this kind of pattern seems to be the case in English, in all the other languages that we've looked at. So if you understand this particular picture right here, you understand the whole section of this talk. All right, now I'm gonna show you some actual data. Um, we looked at 20 languages in a data set. We now have many more languages than this, but in the published paper that this is based on, we have uh, 20 different languages. Eight of them are Indo-European. We've got 10 whole families and four different continents. We've got lots of languages that are not Indo-European. Um, uh, and the way we got the data was we got phonemic word lists with associated word probabilities from some corpus. Of course, there's a wide variety of kinds of corpora that we get this from, but because we're getting a lot of data, hopefully some of this all levels out. And what we do is we calculate the incremental segment information for every segment, exactly as I showed you for thorax and monster before. And then we ask, does the average word probability, does the word probability predict the average segment information in a particular word? The average segment information in thorax is much higher than in monster because of that difference at the beginning of the word. And we get one of, you know, there it's rare in, in research that you get gorgeous, gorgeous data, but this is gorgeous, gorgeous data. On the bottom, we have word probability going from low to high. Um, on the y-axis, we have the average amount of segment information per words. And because we want, we weren't, we didn't have any a priori, a priori reason to think that there would be a difference based on different word lengths, but we weren't sure. So we wanted to test different word lengths independently. And what you can see is for all these languages, the lines trend down. And what that means, just looking here at Arabic, um, this up here means that we've got more average sound information. And as we go this way, we get higher and higher word probability. So words that are encountered more often, and they contain less uh, sound information on average. And we can see that's the case for every one of these languages. They have interesting differences. They've got different steepnesses and they have slightly different responses to word length. And that's of course, something interesting to follow up. Um, so what this tells us to sum up, we already know that less probable words tend to have more segments. And here's my little cartoon of that, less probable words and more probable words. And this is what Zip found and many other people. But what we can now add to this is that less predictable words, less probable words also have segments that more quickly disambiguate them from the competitors. So here's my little cartoon for that. If we have segment information, sound information here, the less probable words are not only longer, but they contain more information at the beginning than the more probable words. And this is efficient. If we assume that producing more informative segments costs more effort, which it surely does at least for many of those segments and producing more of them is more effortful. If we're gonna spend a certain amount of effort as speakers, it's more efficient for us to buy a spend more effort on the things that our listeners need more help with and to cut corners on the things that my, our listeners already expect us to say, because we can. 
as in I've got an animal, it's a cat versus I've got an animal, it's a calf. All right, now I'm gonna to segue to something quite different, but based on exactly the same ideas. This is a picture of Adam right here and our son Aldo also in the mountains very close to us. And what we're gonna, I'm gonna show you is that phonological rules that neutralize word meanings that eliminate contrast between words are preferentially evolved at word ends. So what we predicted is that contrast neutralizing phonological rules like final devoicing in German should be more frequent at word ends. And why did we think that? It's because if we imagine that phonological rules evolve over time through consistent biases in speech, where we have a speech community that tends to shift its pronunciation in particular directions far enough that at some point, children acquiring the language decide that this particular property is categorical, and now it's grammaticalized, we, re we know that listener, um, speakers are more likely to reduce segment information where information is already low. And if that's the case, we imagine that phonological rules which reduce segment information should evolve preferentially away from word beginnings. Okay, so what to do in this particular, there have been people um, in the 70s and people before that certainly noticed, uh, you know, predicted something like this. But uh, no, what, what, what's new is that nobody has actually tried to test this in a rigorous statistical manner. So that's what we're doing here. So previous work is based on case studies, looking for patterns in the literature. And what we're gonna do instead is just assemble a big language sample without reference to our hypothesis and then go into our language sample and code it. So we've got a big, we have 50 different languages. Um, they are intentionally drawn from all over the globe and from many, many different language families. Um, and the reason we actually did this is because we had this little person right here. And as any parent knows, the first six months that you have a little one like this, you are in a state, a constant fog of lack of sleep. And it turns out, as we discovered, that not sleeping enough for two or three nights when you're studying or you're jet lagged, that's one thing. Not having enough sleep for two months, it turns out, is an entirely different thing. So we weren't able to do anything intelligent. And so what we did, we realized we could do a great project that just involved laying on the couch at 3 a.m. between feedings, looking through grammars and coding rules. That's what we did. Okay, so our method was identify all the phonological rules in these 50 grammars that modify the edge of a lexical domain. And by lexical domain, I mean a content morpheme, a word, a phrase, an utterance. Any recognizable domain that has a content morpheme in it. And we didn't include any rules that only applied to functional material because we already know that functional material is very highly reduced, again, because it's very, very frequent and predictable. So then we got all these rules and we classified them by whether they modified the end or the beginning of the word. And then we further classified by whether the rule was neutralizing or non-neutralizing. And what we mean by neutralizing is whether it takes some phonemic contrast in the language and eliminates it. And practically what that means is, in principle, after this rule applies, you could have two surface forms that have different underlying forms that are homophonous. It's a rule that can, could potentially create a homophone, just like word final devoicing in German. And here's some examples of the phonological rules that we found. So for example, a neutralizing rule in Somali um, M neutralizes to N word finally, and M and N are distinct phonemes. And so that's a neutralization. A non-neutralizing rule, for example, ayut um, uh, le the phoneme W is pronounced as a B word initially, but B and W are not contrastive phonemes in the language. B is just an allophone of W, so that's not neutralizing. And this is the data. It's very straightforward data. If you look at uh, the y-axis here, it's just the sheer number of rules. 
And the red is rules that apply to the beginning. The blue is the rules that apply to the end. And on the left here, I've got the non-neutralizing rules. And on the right, we have the neutralizing rules. So there are two things to notice. One is an observation that we didn't predict ahead of time, although it kind of makes sense. And that is that over this whole set of grammars, there are significantly more rules that do something to a word end, whatever it is, than modify the word beginning. Word beginnings are much more phonologically stable than word ends. But if we look at, we specifically look at neutralizations, they're dramatically more common at word ends than word beginnings. There are virtually no neutralizations across the entire grammar, set of grammars that neutralize sounds at the beginnings of words. So that fits, that confirms the hypothesis really nicely. Um, so there are a couple alternative explanations that we looked at. Number one, well, it's not really about word edges. It's about syllable edges because the end of a word, if it's a consonant, is also the end of a syllable. And we there's some evidence that neutralizations in syllable codas are more common than neutralizing neutralizations elsewhere in the syllable. So if we find this word end bias for neutralizations, maybe it's just due to the consonant, it's just due to consonant neutralizing rules at the end. So what we did is we coded all rules at the, for whether or not they involve a coda, and then we just took them out of the data set. Oops, there we go. So we removed all rules. Um, of course, for the um, beginnings, it didn't change anything because none of them are codas. None of those are codas at the beginnings of words. And it essentially took out every rule that applied to a word final consonant in one way or another. So all that's left are rules that apply to word final vowels, so nuclei. And what you can see is it still remains very significant. So word final vowels are much more likely to be subject to some phonologically neutralizing rule than at the beginnings of words, anything else. So it can't be just about codas. Then we looked at one other interesting possibility. It's a little more abstract. Maybe we know that there are phonetic biases that seem to underlie the evolution of phonological rules. And those phonetic biases are not entirely the same at the beginnings of words and the ends of words. So maybe it just happens to be the case that the phon phonetic biases that apply at the ends of words just happen to be more likely to result in neutralization or some narrow subset of them do within the data set. So what we did is we took all the rules in the data set and we divided them roughly into categories of process, assimilation, epenthesis, deletion, devoicing, non-assimilatory manner changes, non-assimilatory place and nasal and duration changes. When you read a lot of grammars, you read that you realize that there are more and more crazy phonological rules out there than we would guess just from reading undergraduate phonology textbooks. And this is part of the reason why we needed some grab bag categories to fill, to fit all of these rules into. And then we just asked, is it the case that all of these rules show the same neutralizing bias towards the end? Or is that, is that um, pattern being driven by a very small number of these different um, uh, processes? In which case, maybe it would be the case that the phonetic biases uh, some sort of asymmetry in the phonetic biases was driving this. And let me take you through this uh, slowly. So we've got number of rules again on the left, uh, the y-axis. And for each one of these bars, we've got different kinds of rules. Um, for example, an assimilation rule. Let's look at that one first. The first stacked bar is the, the rules at the beginning. And this, uh, the second stacked bar is the rules at the end. And the dark part is the neutralizing rules and the light part is the non-neutralizing rules. And the important thing to recognize here is that when you look at the proportion of neutralizing and non-neutralizing rules at the beginning, for assimilation, it looks like it's about 50%. For the end, there are many more neutralizing rules than non-neutralizing rules for assimilation. 
And that's the kind of pattern we see all the way through. For a penthesis, there are no neutralizing rules at the beginning, but there are some at the end. For divorcing, there's a small number of neutralizing rules at the beginning, but quite a few at the end relative to how many rules there are in general. And in fact, this is the case for all of them, except for deletion, where it looks like the proportion is about the same. There are many, many more, many more deletions at word ends than at word beginnings, but the proportion, at least in our data set, is similar. And what that suggests is this is a, a property of languages that is relatively independent of the kind of process. And this is what we would expect if it's not about process at all, but it's about processing because the words, sounds at the ends of words are not important for listeners. And so speakers continually reduce them, produce them with lots of variation. They're just less stable. And so we get more neutralizing rules. It may be just more rules in general. Okay, finally, this particular pattern we, were, we weren't expecting this, but it looks like it's a strong statistical universal, meaning it's pretty constant across all languages. And here's a really beautiful graph that I like. So what we show is that this pattern holds across all the languages and all the geographic areas in the data set. Each one of these um, boxes is a different a recognized linguistic area um, uh, or in the world. What we've got on the y-axis are the number of word initial neutralizing rules for a language, and the x-axis is the word final neutralizing words, rules. So for example, um, we have one European language, and do you, um, I believe that's, uh, I can't remember which one it is, but in this particular language, we have five word final neutralizing rules and zero word initial neutralizing rules. So the dot right is right over here. Now, if there were an equal number of word initial and word final neutralizing rules, we would expect all these dots, each dot is a particular language, to cluster around the diagonal line. And what you can see just scanning across is that every area, the dots are virtually always on this side of the line. So it's all the different language families and all the different language areas of the world are showing exactly the same pattern. So this is kind of exciting. It suggests that this is something, a uh, property of languages that is, or perhaps a property of cognition, linguistic cognition that is so strong that we see it robustly in languages across the planet. All right, some final takeaways. This is the first statistical evidence supporting the hypothesis that phonological grammars preferentially create loss of contrast late in the word, or put another way, they avoid loss of contrast early in the word. Um, this result, as well as the result I showed you before from Adam King, that less probable words, languages evolved front load segment information where it does the most work in less probable words, for example. These are both consistent with the hypothesis that phonological change begins in usage biases happening in real people and real conversations. And that sort of integrated over long periods of time and many conversations across the speech community can shift the forms, the pronunciations of individual words and from there influence the grammar as a whole. And with that, I'm going to thank you. Here's Adam, Aldo, and me um, out grocery shopping. Okay, thank you very much. I'm ready to take any of your questions. Okay, thank you, Professor Wadel, for the insightful talk. We have, um, I think, five or six questions. And um, maybe I'll, I'll ask one by one and then you let us know if you understand the question or if you want some clarification, right? Mm -hmm. um, the first question uh, was asked by An 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 Anthony, or Ant Anton Anthony Felipe. <laughs> and he asked this question, when you refer to effort, 
Does mm. it also refer to the effort the listener makes to understand the utterance? That's an excellent question. And it's not one that I had time to go into in the talk. So this is sort of an uncomfortable piece of this whole um, endeavor. And that is that we don't, that effort, I mean, we sort of know it's out there and it seems to be influencing, you know, there seems to be a clear trade-off between accuracy and effort, but effort itself is likely not a unitary thing. There's effort that can come in at many, many different levels from just how I can get this part of my tongue over to this part of my mouth, the effort that the listener requires in in processing particular things, particular sequences of sounds we know are harder to process than others, harder to distinguish. And then all the cognitive effort that can go into producing particular things or processing particular things. Um, different sounds are differently effortful to perceive in different kinds of noise, for example. Distinguishing fricatives in English, for example, is harder when there's a lot of ambient noise around, high frequency noise. So effort is a big grab bag of things. And it's not, it's probably not the case that every kind of effort has the same kind of influence on language change. The fact that we don't know exactly how to categorize effort cleanly into different pieces and then measure them doesn't, however, mean that we can't use that general idea in some ways in order to uh, test hypotheses. Some kinds of measures are very easy. Like for example, if we simply assume producing, if something takes a longer time to produce, if it has more segments, it's more effortful. These sorts of things are relatively clear, but there's a lot of other kinds of efforts that effort that are maybe more difficult to measure clearly and would require much more language specific work. That's a great question, thank you. Okay, I think the second question is somehow related to this one. Mm -hmm. And it's asked by Professor Filippi Kupski from Bahia. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is sound change always production led or speech production as the trigger or could we consider perception in the lead as well? Uh, depending on the kind. At the, the, if you look at the production perception feedback loop slide that I had before, and there's lots of, there are a number of papers that talk about this in detail, including some that I have references for. There's a, <clears throat> We assume that there's a, a clear, um, every, everybody, virtually everybody who's a speaker is also a hearer. If I hear a novel accent, especially if it's not too far from my own, that starts to become part of my representation for that particular thing. And we know when your representation changes, it influences what you start to say. So since it's a cycle, it's actually, it's sometimes hard to say where did something actually start. But if somebody else comes in, for example, with a novel accent, and I'm the one that changes, we know that it started with me hearing it. It's a perception led, led change. And then it appears in my own productions. So just as a, as a, as a personal example, I grew up in a dialect region of the US that has the ah, ah distinction. I'm exaggerating that, but ah, ah, um, as a phonemic distinction, but basically west of the Rocky Mountains and in all of Canada and many other parts of the US, that distinction is completely merged. So it's just ah. And at this point, I've lived in the West since my twenties. And I think I still, perceive the distinction when I hear it, but I no longer produce it. I no longer produce it accurately and consistently. So that would be something that it's not about my own production. I produce that distinction just fine, but it comes from me hearing. And that's what we expect in this loop. There should be other sound changes that are production led. Okay, thank you. I hope that helps. 
Ah, uh, yes, thank you. The third question was asked by Professor Hanna Kivisto de Souza from Santa Catarina. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asks if, uh, she says, I'd like to know if Dr. Wadel has examined the relation between word frequency and mm -hmm. hyperarticulation across different styles or, or registers, for example, colloquial versus careful speech. Uh, not I have not looked at distinct registers. Um, the work that we did with hyperarticulation that we did in our laboratory was just in colloquial speech. It was in casual, casual speech, the Buckeye corpus. And we found strong relationships between um, uh, frequency and speech rate and between speak, speech rate and the actual magnitude of some of these articulatory gestures, we did not find a strong relationship in casual speech between how frequent a word was and how likely it was to be hyperarticulated. We certainly expected to find it. I mean, I talked before about um, looking for patterns because you have a top-down expectation. All of information theory says that we should find frequency effects because frequency is related to probability and predictability. We were not able to identify those in the casual speech, which I think is really interesting because we certainly looked hard for them. And in, I have, um, I can say that one thing that's been very interesting about these kinds of studies on hyperarticulation related to minimal pairs and contrast is that most of the studies before our study were done with lab speech. Because then you can, of course, control all sorts of things in addition to whether or not this particular word has a minimal pair or not in this particular sound. Um, and the results from lab speech have been very unstable. Some people find a little effect, some people don't find a little effect. And so it's been a big muddle with lab speech. And my hypothesis, my suspicion, although I don't know because I haven't tested it, my suspicion is that this is because in lab speech, we're already reaching some sort of a ceiling in hyperarticulation. One of the things that we know with regard to, for example, voice onset time. In lab speech, the voiceless voice onset time for PTK tends to be 80, 100, 110 milliseconds. They're quite long because people are hyperarticulating and they're speaking slowly. In the casual speech in the Buckeye, it's down around 50 or 60 milliseconds. It's almost half, it's two thirds the extent as in the lab speech, a, a sort of a normal kind of lab speech. And it's possible. One of the things that I wondered if it's better, instead of um, calling this hyperarticulation, if it's better to think about it as avoidance of reduction. And if in casual speech, speakers are always skating sort of at the edge of being too reduced to be clear, well, they can go ahead and reduce very, very close to not being clear between this sound and the other if there's no contrast between those two sounds in this particular word, in this particular position but maybe what they do is they maintain greater distance when the contrast is important. But in lab speech, where it's all always a really big difference, there's nothing to see because there's no, you're never getting close to a, a dangerous reduction. This is my guess. I would love for somebody to test this. Okay, thank you. There is a question here uh, by, uh, sent uh, by Vitor Lemos. Mm -hmm. Uh, Victor asks, uh, he mentions that you've mentioned speech community, consistent variants, and the fact that we imitate each other in order to keep such consistency. Mm -hmm. And then his question is, does your work make any reference to Skinner's verbal behavior? Um, no, and I don't actually know what, I don't know enough about that to comment. <coughs> Okay. That wasn't, Skinner was not part of my linguistics education. Okay, thank you. So I'll move on to the next question by Karen Cardenas, who is from Mexico. Uh, Karen asks, 
uh, she has two questions. Mm -hmm. So first part is from the elaboration of inferences, for example, predictive inferences, is the production of words or phrases easier? Um, easier because I didn't understand the question. Yeah, I, um, I think maybe if I read the second part, you, you might understand it. Does the elaboration of predictive inferences at the phonological level facilitate the understanding and interpretation of the meaning of the words? When you, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the word yeah. elaboration in this context. So elaboration of maybe, um, you know, more detailed inference based on small cues. If this is what is meant, then yes, of course. Um, predictive inference is at the base of all of this. Um, and so the, we don't have really good information of sort of the edges of what people, what kinds of context people take into account in what situations, to my knowledge. Um, but in principle, more should be better, provided that it doesn't overload our processing capacity. There's always, this is the trade-off between effort and accuracy again, mm. taking into account more context and making more complex inferences requires more cognitive effort and more memory. So we should find interesting trade-offs there and people do. Okay. The sixth question is by Hannah Kivisto de Souza again from Santa Catarina. Mm -hmm. uh, she asked us, um, I'm curious to hear whether they, whether your research, in, you and your research observed any differences between fixed word stress and more, unpredictab uh, more unpredictably stressed languages. And she's thinking about the case, for example, of Finnish and English. Um, I assume we're talking about the phonological neutralization part. Um, we did not look at that carefully, although I suspect that's going to make a difference for, and one of the things that we did do that's sort of related is we looked at um, languages that are exclusively suffixing or exclusively prefixing or mixed. And that's of course going to be correlated with stress. Languages that are exclusively prefixing are going to be more likely to have final stress on the stem or the root. And we did not find a, a statistically significant difference in the likelihood that a final rule was going to be neutralizing or not. But what we did find is that there were many fewer edge related rules in the prefixing languages. And what I would suspect is, or you know, um, I would suspect that in languages that have final stress, there are, you are, you are likely to find fewer rules that specifically target the end of the word. And that simply follows from the idea that the stressed syllable, all else being equal, is going to be more phonetically informative for the listener. There's more information there because it's stressed, it's louder, higher pitch, all the things that go along with stress. And if we assume that these sorts of processes of variation and reduction shape the long-term trajectory of a language, parts of words that are consistently not reduced are the parts of words that are gonna have fewer changes imposed upon them by the phonology and in particular, fewer neutralizing changes. That's my prediction. And that's a prediction that follows from a lot of, that's a top-down prediction that follows from a lot of theory. Okay. And the next question was asked by Paula Cortez from Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And she asks, could this be studied diachronically in a single language? In principle, absolutely. Um, we... In 2013, we did something similar. We looked at mergers of phonemes. So like for me, the ah-ah merger in, that's happened in Western um, uh, 
American English. And of course, there are many interesting mergers that have happened in New World Spanish relative to Iberian Spanish. And what we did was ask, we, were, we, we asked the diachronic question. We looked when we had information about a previous state of the language, not very far back, a few hundred years back, where there was a particular phoneme contrast that existed. And in the modern version of the language, or at least some modern version of the language, that contrast had merged. We asked, did the actual number of minimal pairs distinguished by that contrast predict whether the contrast was likely to merge or not? And we found that, yes, it was a very, very strong predictor. And in fact, a better predictor than many of the sort of more complicated measures of functional load that had been proposed in the past. So just as an example, in English, we have this incredibly crowded front vowel space, you know, e, i, e, a, a, you know, that, you know, vowels that are really too close together. We shouldn't have this system. It's a bad system phonetically. But what we know is, our language has sort of evolved itself into a corner where it can't afford to lose those vowels because so many word distinctions depend on those. Now, in the dialect that I grew up with, a and a are also very, very close, but there is only a handful of words that actually depend on that contrast. And what we find is that that contrast merges over and over again in different dialects of at least North American English, where there are very, very few minimal pairs. So that's a kind of a diachronic study that looks at language change in relation to the information contributed by particular sounds. I think there would be lots of other ways to look at it. Of course, we, it's hard to look at fine grained pronunciation details because we don't have recordings from a long time ago. Although I recommend you look at the work that's come out of University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. They have a, they have a, a corpus of casual New Zealand English from now reaching all the way back to about 1900 or so. It's nearly, it's about a century of language and New Zealand English has been under, undergoing very rapid changes. So they've actually done a bunch of diachronic studies that are related to this. I have one of those um, papers by Martin Shoshkuti in the references at the, uh, at the bottom of my slideshow. I would recommend looking at that if you're interested because the, the work is beautiful and the data set is, it's magic. It's a magical data set um, that we're very, very, all very, very lucky to have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, uh, I would like to mention that Professor Thais Cristóforo Silva, who I mentioned at the beginning, she's watching us here, so it's a pleasure to have her with us. And uh, actually, to add to your answer to this last question, Professor um, Cristóforo Silva has conducted studies with Brazilian Portuguese, so a single language and also probably not in the diachronic perspective that uh, that our, uh, I forgot her name now, the, our uh, Paula has asked, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, she has lots of studies uh, investigating Brazilian Portuguese. Okay, well, I will look uh, at immediately. Yeah. Okay, I have prepared two questions, but since we had such great questions, I think I'll ask only one. Um, I work with second language uh, development, and we also sometimes refer to functional load, both to explain the importance of uh, learning some categories, uh, mm -hmm. but also to try to account for why certain categories are so hard to to, um, to learn, for example, CODAS, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my question is just because I know that you use functional load a lot in your studies, what are the measures that you would recommend for our studies? You, you just mentioned that actually in your last answer, but what do you think is a reliable way of um, testing for uh, testing functional load or assessing functional load? So, I can tell you what I think doesn't work. Okay. So in all of, so 
Charles Hockett back in the 1960s and other people in the, the 90s and the 2000s talked a lot about how you could measure the functional load of particular oppositions in a language um, using the concept of entropy. And basically one way to, a simple way to think about this is a language has a bunch of different oppositions, contrasts, and if you just take make a random sequence of those oppositions, you can communicate a certain amount of information in this number of segments, of symbols. And then if you take two of those symbols and you just make them the same, suddenly that same string is, has the same number of segments, but there's less information in it because you've lost some particular thing. And the average amount of information that you lose when you merge two segments across the entire language is we say that that's the contribution of that contrast to the entropy of the language where the entropy is a measure of how much information can be transmitted with a given amount of material. And Hockett and many of these other people said, okay, this is going to be the best way to measure functional load. So in all of the work that we've done, because that's a theoretically, that's been theoretically proposed, we've tested that. But what we found is just the number of minimal pairs, which is a very low, it's not a global measure of functional load, it's a local measure of functional load. In this word, does this sound do a lot of work to distinguish it from some other word? And if you just count that up, we've always found that to give a much better statistical fit to the data than the entropy measure. So I would say measures of global, this is what if I, this is not my field, of course. So I'm not familiar with everything that people do, but if I were starting out and I didn't know anything else, I would guess that measures of how much local contrast, for example, how many minimal pairs are distinguished by some contrast might do better at explaining some features of second language acquisition than a more global measure of contrast. And I only say that because that's what we find in all of our data. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I think I asked all the questions that were sent here. Um, I would like to thank Professor Weidel for being with us today and the, all the insights that we got from your talk, they were just great, right? So thank you very much. We are um, living difficult times because of the coronavirus pandemic here in Brazil and all over the world. But we have been lucky to count on Abralin, uh, mm -hmm. Abralin events to be able to discuss important academic research topics such as yours, right? And I would like to thank the audience. Uh, we had many people here in the chat that I was trying to uh, read everything and bring to you the important questions. So thank you all for the questions. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank Tradu Points professionals who have been offering translations for the Abralin events. So if you want to say some final words. Well, I, all I would like to say is thank you mm -hmm. very, very much, Abralin and all the people who are working on this for making this event possible for doing all the work to put it all together, looking at all of the people who are speaking here and knowing that their lectures are recorded and are going to be in a, basically a big library of lectures right now. I think that that's going to be a great contribution educationally and contentfully to our field. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.